Welcome. Welcome to the Colorado College Big Idea Competition number four. We We have five really awesome teams. I think you're going to not only kind of be intrigued, but be impressed. And I wouldn't even be surprised if some of you weren't reaching to say, Where, how can I get my checkbook out? I want to be a part of this thing. So these are, this is not kind of like just show presentations. These are real teams looking to do real innovative things and really excited that you're here to be part of uh, this exciting day for all, all of the teams. Um, all the, between each of the, the teams, there'll be a number of announcements. So we have awesome judges here. I'll introduce them a, a little bit later. Um, I'll explain a little bit more about the program. And so, you know, don't be surprised if you don't hear everything now. We'll fill it in as each team stays stages up to keep this as a rapid fire um, event. But again, we're really glad. Cheering is encouraged. So cell phones, we ask that you turn off, but cheer at appropriate um, points. And, uh, and then we'll have time with the judges. So it's the teams. I'll explain a little bit more of the process. But before we do any other introductions, I'd like to, to introduce you to the president of Colorado College, Jill Tiefenthaler, and invite her up to give us a few comments. Thank you, Patrick, and welcome, everyone. I'm glad that you all joined us for the fourth annual Big Idea Competition. In addition to welcoming students, faculty, and staff, we're fortunate to have with us alumni and members of our Colorado Springs community who've given their time, contributed ideas, and donated funds that now allow Colorado College to do many of the great things we do. There's some specific people I want to thank today. First, the Big Idea team. Program Director and Innovation Institute Executive Director Patrick Boltema, thank you Patrick, and Program Manager Jill Lang. Please join me in thanking them for all the work that they've done. I also want to thank our esteemed judges. Patrick, as you mentioned, will be introducing them shortly, but they bring incredible knowledge, expertise, and feedback. I want to encourage our students um, to try to meet them. Um, while they're here with us, they're leaders in their professions and innovators, and you can learn a lot from them, as well as being great CC alums. Thanks also to our students and mentors who are participating. You're really examples of what's possible with the resources and infrastructure that's dedicated to moving our exceptional education into problem solving and practice. A liberal, education, a liberal arts education provides the best platform for generating ideas, creativity, and insights. At CC, we asked ourselves, how do we unlock the value of liberal arts um, education for opportunities and challenges in society? And how do we help our students contribute, contribute their innovative thinking in concrete ways? In CC, it's about moving from ideas to action to make an impact in the world. And that's what the Strategic Innovation at CC initiative is all about. Unlocking the value of a liberal arts education for making a difference in the world. And how are we doing that? Drawing out the great elements of our educational program that we already have, especially making the most of what our block plan allows. In addition, co-curricular learning that serves as a complement to the liberal arts education. Additional ways for students to pursue their passions, and the big idea is one example of that. We've had a year of great progress towards these goals for this initiative. And in the fall, we announced a lead gift, $8.5 million toward innovation. And part of that gift goes to the Endowed Chair in Innovation and part toward a new building that will house our innovation program in the incredible years, an incredible gift to the college. In addition, this year, we started our Innovator in Residence program, which is thriving. New courses have been developed and taught. We thought about new ways to recognize our students' academic and co-curricular work, and there will be more to come in coming years. So thank you all for joining us today. We're so excited to hear these great big ideas. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks. OK, so it's five teams. Each team will have 10 minutes, up to 10 minutes, to give their pitch. And then there's five minutes of Q&A time with the judges. If a team completes their pitch in less than five minutes, or 10 minutes, that time gets added to the Q&A time. And we know that a lot of times the really important things come out in that Q&A. So the teams have been encouraged to try and keep their presentations to more like seven minutes. You are encouraged to cheer. 
So cheer when teams are announced, cheer when teams um, complete, and at the end, I know some of the teams have encouraged you to be here as their cheering section, and there will in fact be a competition. Between, I'll be making announcements, and we'll be having drawings for um, prizes, door prizes. Um, and I'll tell you a little bit more about that as we go, but you're not gonna wanna leave, because I will tell you the last grand prize that'll be uh, drawn is a $500 gift certificate or certificate to Mountain Chalet. So you'll wanna make sure you stay here to see the end. Um, as the judges convene, and, and you all heard there's $50,000 at stake here, and the judges will be making investment decisions to help further um, teams as they pursue their innovation um, ideas into action for making an impact in the world. While the judges convene, we're lucky to have the critical karaoke gang, CC professors, that will be uh, entertaining, and we should be back in 10 minutes or so with the checks, the big ceremonial um, checks of the $50,000. So that's the plan, and we're ready for the first team. First up is King of the Sea, CC student team members presenting are Nick Kramer and Peter Wales. Timer. Thanks, Patrick. And thank you guys for being here today and letting us talk at you for several hours. It's a pretty cool opportunity. Um, so yeah, so like Patrick said, I'm Nick. This is Peter. Uh, we are King of the Sea, a company through which we hope to create the market for a particularly destructive an invasive, albeit edible, species of fish in the Caribbean and Western Atlantic called lionfish. And this is a very crude uh, Microsoft Paint sponsored power, uh, logo that we're working on. Okay. So, um, for those of you who may not know about lionfish, I want to start with a little bit of background just about the species and why we should care, period, uh, about a fish. Um, lionfish were first introduced into this part of the world. They come originally from the Indian Ocean in the 90s when a hurricane off the coast of southern Florida ruptured an aquarium and just six of these fish got out into the ocean. Um, since then, you can see the progeny of these original six fish have spread as far north as Massachusetts, as far south as Venezuela. So we're no longer talking six, but millions and millions of these, uh, which are incredibly detrimental to local ecosystems. Um, by some reckonings, this is already the worst natural disaster of the century thus far. Um, this, I think, is a particularly poignant picture. Kind of gets at what I'm talking about. You can see all of these silver fish down here uh, originated, well, originated, came from the stomach of this lionfish. So at the time it was caught, this fish was in the process of digesting all these fish, which is not only, I think, a little impressive, but horrifying if you... Keep in mind that these lionfish have no natural predators. They have a much faster breeding rate than a lot of local populations. Uh, it's just the perfect storm of bad news for the waters that they swim in. Um, needless to say, the repercussions aren't just environmental. The lionfish are out competing a number of native populations which are key to commercial fishing. Uh, they're accelerating coral reef decay, which in turn affects diving and other tourist-related industries, which may not seem like a big deal to us, but for, in a lot of Caribbean countries, that can account for nearly half their GDP. Um, so just not, not a good, a force for good in the world. The good news is we can do this. They are not only palatable, but um, I would go so far as to say delicious. They're kind of an interesting multifaceted fish. They have the outside, cooked like this, is sort of similar to a bass. Um, has, as you get deeper into the fish, it's more akin to a lobster. It gets a little softer. They're really tasty. We'll get into that in a sec. Um, since they're a slightly smaller fish than like a tuna or a swordfish, they are uh, lower in mercury, so they're actually also a healthier option. The long and the short of it is, in a world where commercial fishing is becoming increasingly controversial, this is a species that really isn't. There's no regulations on catching them. If we could overfish these populations, it would be great, um, ecologically speaking. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Peter, who's going to talk a little bit more about where exactly we, too, fit into the story. Great. So currently, lionfish are being caught as bycatch by crab and lobster fishermen. Uh, there's also a handful of men and women who go out and spearfish lionfish. Via these methods, the supply is limited, and these lionfish populations are continuing to rise. 
But fortunately, there's legislation in place to implement a large-scale trapping program. Now, this large-scale trapping program is going to make fishing linefish just as efficient as fishing crab and potentially even more profitable. So here's an estimation of our company timeline. So right now, we're making partnerships with restaurants here in Colorado Springs and also restaurants and fishermen down in Florida. Uh, we're also talking to UPS about a potential shipping partnership where they can provide us with uh, free or discounted shipping and we can provide them with great PR. When the large-scale trapping, uh, trapping program is implemented in the fall of 2016, we're going to be able to reach a much broader cust customer demographic, which is going to increase consumer demand. Now, this increase in consumer demand is going to incentivize many more fishermen to go out and fish linefish, increasing supply, which is going to lower our prices. With these lower prices, our end goal around year five is to have a packaged grocery store lionfish product, which is going to allow us to reach so many more people and get so many more of these fish out of the ocean. So here's a quick breakdown of our financials. Um, our main cost is going to be buying the fish, and our main revenue is going to be selling the fish. We're also going to incur some uh, marketing and shipping costs, but given this, we're still estimating that we're going to be profitable starting year one. I want to talk just really briefly about in a little more detail about some of the current inroads we've already made with the company. Uh, we reached out initially to Bill Kelly, who's the head of the Florida Keys Commercial Fishermen's Association, who's been super helpful in helping us learn about the industry, uh, connecting us to other concerned parties. He himself is enthusiastic about the idea. He thinks, like we do, that this is really going to take off. Um, through him, we met this guy, Gary Nichols, kind of the undisputed lionfish champion of the Florida Keys. He brings in more than anybody else. And Rachel Bowman, pictured here, the self-proclaimed lionfish huntress, who has actually already been shipping us some fish. We got a 20-pound shipment last Friday, which in turn we flipped at the Blue Star. Uh, we've established a relationship with Joe Coleman, who many of you may know owns not only the Blue Star, but Nosh and Laos here in town in Colorado Springs. He's excited to get the fish on his menu. He really sees this as an opportunity. So had you been at the Blue Star on Saturday, you would have seen lionfish on the specials menu. Um, and it was extremely popular. It sold out very quickly, which uh, rather than me talk more about that, I think now I'm actually going to turn it over to Tim Morrissey. We're fortunate enough to have with us today the head chef at the Blue Star. He's been kind enough to come down and represent the company. He's prepared for you guys a little bit of a lionfish sampler in case you want to try for yourselves what it is we're talking about. Um, and may just say a couple brief words about the whole process. Well, it was fun to remove the poison. It was risky, but uh, it was really good fish, and it's something like I've never seen before when it comes to the texture of it. It's like a cross between the flakiness of a sea bass, and then it's dense in the middle like a lobster would be. So I sold all 20 pounds that they gave to me in an hour and a half on Saturday night, and I'm excited to have it on our menu, and I can move 20 pounds in one night, then I'll obviously be continuing to buy this product from them. Thank you, Tim. Well, thank you, Tim. Uh, I don't mean to bother your eating here, but uh, we're uh, tight for time. So we've prepared two asks for you. Uh, because we're a product-based company, our initial inventory is paramount to our operations. With $5,000 in initial inventory, we can get off the ground running with our current partners. But with an additional $15,000 in inventory on top of that, we can immediately make new partnerships and be better prepared for when this large-scale trapping program is implemented. Um, so the long of the short of it, with this additional $15,000 in inventory, we're estimating that we're going to have an additional $100,000 in income over the first three years of operations. But much more importantly than that, that $100,000 in additional income amounts to a whole lot more of these lionfish getting out of the ocean. Thank you very much. Great talk. Judges, questions? Uh, I've got a couple. Will, yeah. will the exist, you're expecting the existing fishermen to convert and trap. And, right. And what is the risk of byproduct or other risks in the trapping of lionfish? You mean like what bycatch right. would be possible? Well, that's one of the uh, pieces of good news. So since they're primarily caught as bycatch in, say, lobster traps, the modification of the traps is such that um, it's pretty specific to slow-moving 
things. There's not like uh, quick darting fish are not going to get caught in this. I'm sure they're not non-existent. Um, they mostly these traps will target specifically lionfish. I suppose if there is bycatch, it's going to be things like lobster and crab, which then can be turned for a profit pretty quickly. And then what about the spines? The risk there for both the fisherman, the diver, the diner, and the processor. Well, the, I'd say the, the last, I'll start with the last one is easy. The risk for the diner is non-existent. The venom exists at the very tip of the spine, which is one of the first stages of processing is cutting those off. We have some personal experience with getting poked. It's not fun, but not lethal, uh, just like a really bad bee sting. So um, part of, and this is we've talked with Tim, uh, we are working eventually to partner with a processing company and they would have a method. I mean, we've been using scissors very, very effectively. You just chop off all the spines and then you it, treat it like a normal fish. So that is obviously a concern. It's a neurotoxin, but uh, when dealt with properly, not really a big deal. How do you differentiate yourself from the big seafood distributors like a Seattle Seafood so you can keep your niche when they get interested? Well, I think... Uh, Already one big difference is our eco-friendly underpinnings. We're, uh, if I can be so bold as to say, a little trendier. Uh, we really are trying to tap into the market of environmentally responsible consumers who, like I said, already uh, fishing and especially commercial ocean fishing is becoming such a controversial subject. I think a lot of the customers for some of those larger seafood companies are, are moving away from that because of those underlying reasons. And we have this intrinsically marketable product that, I mean, what good soccer parent is going to keep feeding their kids tuna sandwiches when you could have lionfish? You know? So given the, the scope of the problem that's growing, right. probably geometrically, and your business model, which looks really good, the margins look good, um, what, what does your model do to solve this problem? And is this model aggressive enough and bold enough to make a difference? So, do you want to take this? Sure. So essentially what we're doing here is we're creating these partnerships with fish houses and fishermen in Florida right now and restaurants also because the fish is the price, the current price level is so it only makes sense to sell the fish in restaurants. So we're situating ourselves in the market so that we're going to be prepared for when this large scale trapping program is implemented to get as many of these fish out of the ocean as possible. And to speak, I think, to whether it's aggressive enough, um, this is, I think we're in a position of doing everything that we can based on the situation and our, our end goal, as we said, is to work into a position where we have a grocery store product, a full partnership with processing companies, and hopefully be cranking out the <clears throat> on par with some of those larger seafood companies. Uh, whether it'll work, who knows? This is one of the only ways that we seem to have to combat the problem. And there's no one else in the market right now. It's just us. And I just want to go back again. You know that there are traps that trap lionfish. You're comfortable that there's no technology that you have to improve? Yes, no, absolutely. That's all through this. the head of the Florida Keys Commercial Fishermen's Association. There have been recently some, uh, last month, a summit on it. Um, the technology exists, and it's just a matter of kind of passing the litigation for some of the concerns you expressed, whether there will be significant bycatch of other species, et cetera. But as far as we can tell and as far as what Bill says, um, yeah, we're anticipating maybe even later this year that these could start going into place. I have a couple comments. First of all, this is delicious. Yes. I wish we could pass it around. Great. <laughs> and I was going to ask what, what, Bob, what Bob asked about. Um, how can we? <laughs> <laughs> no, it is really good. Do we have more for and I also was just, I'm from San Francisco, and I think San Francisco would be a great market to start with this product if you could get in there as soon as possible. And I wish you the best of luck. Thank you very much. Since we have time for another question, let's say you ran into somebody who's been scuba diving in the Caribbean since he was seven, and he just hates these things for what they're destroying. They want to give you a lot more money. What would you do differently than your current plan? That's a good question. Peter, do you have anything pop immediately into mind? I can think of a couple things. Yeah, so 
uh, the scenario that we had a big investor come and give us a large lump sum of money? Yes. Is that the question? Yep, that's the question. Yeah. I mean, so, what, would, what would you put it into? Would it be traps, processors? Yeah, so I think a, a fair amount of that would go into marketing. Um, we could do things such as, um, and you're all familiar with Red Bull, and they sponsor a whole lot of events, so we could do something like a, a big lionfish hunting day where it's like a community event in Florida, and everyone goes out and hunts the heck out of lionfish, and it would be awesome. And also great publicity about the fish and how it's a, a big problem. Um, we could also start uh, partnering with more, more and more fishermen and convincing them to start fishing lionfish instead of crab or lobster or whatever they're currently doing. And then lastly, I think what we could also do is maybe even go to the lobbyist route because try and just hurry up this whole implementation of getting this legislation passed for the large scale trapping program, which will get passed. But if we have the money to hurry up the process, why not? Also maybe mercenaries, <laughs> flying fish mercenaries. <laughs> So mercenary, you mean a, a more I mean closed highly trained channel? seagoing experts that would hunt down every last one. <laughs> yeah, hire time. your own hunters and trappers. What's that? You're saying hire your own hunter and trappers. Right, right. And right. control the market end to end. Yeah. yeah. And I think I just it's not a negative, but it, I, your SGNA is way off base. You have 18,000 for SGNA and at the first year, and that's there's the two of you 9,000 apiece, which is barely not a living wage, and you're gonna need more money to either build the first round of traps for the fish fishermen, but you're also gonna need more money for marketing because you're not gonna get the fishermen to convert until there's demand and blah, 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 blah. Mm -hmm. But uh, that's just, that's where you would put the money. Great, Great. thank you so much, King of the Sea. <laughs> Solving environmental problems through better eating. So while our next team is staging, and I want to take a couple moments to introduce our um, panel of judges. Um, first, Elizabeth Liz McLean Larnard. Um, she graduated from CC. So bachelor's in English in 1983 and an MBA from Keller Graduate School of Management in 91. Um, she served on the CC alumni board in the 90s and was a CC trustee from 2003 to 2011. After a sales career in what was then known as telecommunications for AT&T, um, she now has um, three teenage boys and volunteers for the, with the San Francisco Symphony, her children's schools, and administers grants for her family's foundation. Liz also enjoys music, skiing, and staying involved with the Colorado College community, and we're glad you're here. Thank you so much. Next is Huntington Lambert Hunt. Hunt is the Dean of Continuing Education and University Extension at a little school on the East Coast named Harvard University. Um, he's the, uh, the, his division serves 25,000 students annually and includes Harvard Extension School with more than 7,500 online and on-campus courses as well as 40 undergraduate and graduate degree programs and fields of study. Um, under Hunt's leadership, also the Harvard Summer School, Harvard Institute for Learning and Retirement, Harvard Professional Development Programs, and the Crimson Summer Academy. But previously, Hunt um, served as the Associate Provost at Colorado State University, where am among other accomplishments, he have founded, founded and was the interim CEO of the CSU Global Campus. Hunt was also director of the Colorado State Entrepreneurship Center and a former member of the faculty of, of the College of Business. And it was actually during that time that Hunt and I um, got acquainted. I think somebody must have canceled on a lecture on you, and so you kind of dug me up to, yeah, 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 yeah. So, but during his um, business career, Hunt has been part of 25 startups in 12 countries, with 22 still operating, um, and he continues to teach between his dean responsibilities at Harvard, strategy entrepreneurship, and business plan development. So Hunt, welcome back to Colorado College. <laughs> Next is Scott Smith. Upon graduating from Colorado College in the 70s, Scott devoted himself to environmental issues, and listen to this, he served as the speechwriter for the president of the Sierra Club. That's kind of cool, huh? Um, his interest in the environment drove him to law school, um, however, upon graduation, he developed a keen interest in business. During the 80s, he was a successful mergers and acquisitions lawyer. 
Um, in 1990, he opened the venture law practice of Pillsbury Winthrop in Menlo Park, California, and began a career in advising and investing in venture stage technology companies. Uh, later on, at Credit Suisse First Boston, he focused on technology IPOs. Since 1998, he has run a merchant bank in San Francisco with offices in Greenwich, Connecticut, Beijing, and Shanghai, focused on technology, healthcare, and renewable energy companies. He remains deeply committed to environmental issues. Scott, welcome back. And finally, let me introduce Bob Selig. Um, Bob also is a CC alum and a long-standing cur and current board member of the, the Board of Trustees. Um, he is the president of Davis Instrument Company um, in the Bay Area, and, and it's a company that Bob actually founded 46 years ago with a fellow MBA um, grad at, uh, from Stanford. Um, he lives in the heart of Silicon Valley, engages in a wide range of, uh, with a wide range of entrepreneurs, both as an advisor and an investor. Um, his ongoing going community commitments include over a decade of leadership at the Ronald McDonald House at Stanford, um, Stanford Associates, an alum organization, Stanford Medical Center. Um, he supported Vita Verde Outdoor Education since its founding by CC grads in 2002. Um, and Bob, as you, as you heard uh, Jill Tiefenthaler, President Tiefenthaler mention, has been really an, an anchor of support and encouragement for this whole innovation theme. So really, we owe you a, a debt of gratitude, Bob, for all that you've done for Colorado College. Thank you. So our judges. Next up, next up is Spindle. Presenting today for Spindle is Benjamin Hicks and Alex Sheffield. Jet Snow. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Patrick. I'm Alex Sheffield, and I'm a neuroscience major. And I'm Ben Hicks, also a neuroscience major. And we're here to talk to you today about our smart sleep mask, which is able to improve your memory. So let me start by asking you one simple question. Have you ever bumped into someone that you met recently and realized that for the life of you, you could not remember their name? This could be a friend of a friend, a client, or a coworker. Regardless of who this may be, I'm sure we can all relate. Now, this kind of forgetfulness is all too common in our day-to-day -day lives. But what causes it? How come you're able to recite every lyric to Beyonce's Single Ladies after hearing it once on the radio, but you can't remember a simple name that you learned last week? Well, to understand memory, you first have to understand the time of day you would least expect learning to take place during your sleep. This is because it's actually during sleep when your brain decides whether to keep or throw out its memories, a process known as memory consolidation. But not all sleep is the same. The deepest phase of sleep is known as the N3 phase, during which slow wave sleep occurs. These slow waves and fast sequences called spindles, hence our name, are heavily involved in memory consolidation. And this is where we come in. By stimulating your brain using our, our smart sleep mask during slow wave sleep, we increase slow waves, spindles, and ultimately increase the amount of memory stored during the night. Here's a general schematic of how our mask functions. An EEG is placed over the prefrontal cortex, which is the region right here, and records brain activity from that region. The electrode is covered by a conductive fabric, thus to avoid interference of the signal and reduce discomfort by the user. These signals are then sent to an EEG chip, where they're processed into brain waves. These brain waves are then further processed using a variety of hardware, software, and our custom algorithm, finding resulting in tones played through the mask. These tones are the stimulation that increase slow waves and ultimately improve memory. We'll also include an app with our, with our product so that users may adjust the settings and see the effects of stimulation. While we haven't built any physical masks yet, I've already made a fully functional software prototype and have begun testing it on myself with great results. Ironically, on my endeavor to improve sleep, I've actually lost quite a bit of it, so I'm hoping to recover a bit once this is all done. <laughs> the research behind Spindle is very extensive and goes back decades, being published in top neuroscience journals, including Neuron and the Journal of Neuroscience. The first researcher to effectively demonstrate the method our mask uses was Dr. Hong, a researcher I've been communicating with for the past year. You can see the results of Dr. Hong's first study in the lower left-hand corner. Compared to a sham group, those that received the stimulation our mask provides had a 69% improved recall the next morning. Though this is only regards to a memory task, 
Keep in mind this score improvement is double that which the average SAT tutoring company promises to improve your scores by after weeks of tutoring. And this was just a single night of stimulation. As an emerging startup, we want to stay true to our core value statement, that everyone should have access to their greatest mental potential, whether that be helping a student get that A they've always dreamed of, or helping a high-functioning entrepreneur get that extra edge she needs to succeed. But the implications of our smart mask goes far beyond personal success. Imagine being able to grow old while remembering in clear detail the first steps of your child, the look in your love's eyes as you stood with them at the altar, the name of your grandkids and great-grandkids after that. At Spindle, we believe remembering important events such as these shouldn't be a luxury, but a human right. And I know this may all seem like science fiction right now, but this is already an established technology in academia, and all we're doing is bringing it to the greater community. Spindle is actually not the first company to introduce sleep neurotechnology to the market. A company located right here in Colorado Springs, Sleep Shepherd, has recently launched a new product called the Sleep Shepherd Blue, which is a headband that using EEG technology, actually similar to that in our sleep mask, wants to help you fall asleep and stay asleep throughout the night. They recently launched a Kickstarter for their new product and met their goal the first day, and within a month, raised almost $700,000. This shows not only market validity, but consumer willingness and acceptance of this type of technology. Due to our similar methods, we reached out to Sleep Shepherd for advice, and this relationship has grown to the point where Jesse McClure, head engineer of the Sleep Shepherd, is on our advisory board. The Spindle team is currently comprised of two neuroscience majors, myself and Ben Hicks, along with an environmental policy major, Henry Alderson Smith. As I mentioned previously, Jesse McClure, head engineer of Sleep Shepherd, is one of our advisors. He helps with the technical aspect of mass development and has extensive experience in the manufacturing process. Our other advisor, also named Jesse, Jesse Marble, works at Magneti Marketing. He helps us with the advertising and marketing side of our business. He also won the big idea several years ago for his EEG device that predicted seizures in epileptic patients. Because of his combination of EEG experience and entrepreneurship, he's an ideal resource as Spindle seeks to enter the neurotech industry. And if anyone in the audience knows anyone named Jesse or is named Jesse and would like to become our advisor, we'd love to welcome you aboard after such great success with the first couple. Spindle is seeking to uh, raise between $250,000 and $500,000 for our market entry. With this money, we would create 10,000 to 40,000 units, which we would sell indirectly through areas such as Amazon or Best Buy at a 55% gross margin, and directly through our website at a 77% gross margin and $200 MSRP. Given our current state and resources, we would be ready for mass production no later than May 2018, not coincidentally the same time when we would all be graduating from college. <laughs> Today we are seeking $38,000 in order to prepare us for this second round of fundraising. With this money, we would create functional prototypes which we could use for product development as well as market research. A portion of this money would be allocated towards contracting an app developer in order to create a platform for which our service could be fully utilized. It's important to have the pairing of the app with the mask, as the app provides a way for our users to interact and directly see their results. The first use of this money, however, will go towards finishing our patent process. We've already filed a provisional patent, but we will definitely need more legal advice, as we seek to make a much more comprehensive claim in the near future. The brain is humanity's greatest untapped resource. Every love found, Every war fought or invention created is owed to the three pound pink mass sitting between your ears right now. For thousands of years, humans have been progressing technologically and socially, but our minds remain stunted, functioning exactly as they did during the Stone Age. So when looking for science's next big breakthrough, why not start at the source of all of humanity, the resource which catapulted humans to the top of the pecking order and the forefront of innovation? Given the current rate of neuroscientific discovery, the people in this room will live to see the mind unlocked in ways never thought imaginable. Spindle wants to be in the forefront of this endeavor, constantly working to transcend biological limitations, improving the world one mind at a time. Thank you. This Spindle really resonates with me because I would love to call my wife tonight and tell her what I had for breakfast at the San Francisco <laughs> airport. But I can't remember because obviously I didn't have quality sleep last night. Yeah, it's important mm -hmm. stuff. Okay. Um, 
You know, there are a lot of questions. I mean, it's a great presentation. There's adequate fact that margins, if they're real, are really good. Um, I don't know anything about the FDA and whether this is a class one medical device. And if that's so, then that's, you know, it's a whole new game, right? You know, you, you have a good team, but you don't have noteworthy scientists and docs and so forth up there. And you, you need to build your team around people who can um, affirm what you've done and so forth. And, mm -hmm. and I'm sure in this area, and maybe it, at CU uh, Med School. There's a guy in Palo Alto, um, um, Bill Dement, who's uh, probably uh, in his 80s now. He's an emeritus professor at Stanford. Mm -hmm. He's considered the father of sleep science. He started it all, right? Mm -hmm. And started the original sleep clinic at Stanford University. You're aware of that? Okay. You know, these guys would be, I, I think um, open to conversation and you know you need some people who are willing to get involved and actually recommend this thing Absolutely. it'll fly after, after yeah. that so well um, just to address the FDA uh, part of that um, so Jesse Marble who uh, won the big idea for his yeah. he had a device which predicted seizures in uh, epileptic patients and yeah. so he ran into some troubles with the FDA so we've actually like uh, very strategically designed our business plan to avoid uh, treating anyone who has any kind of illness or any yeah. kind of diagnostic, so we would avoid that process and not run into the same problem our advisor did. Mm -hmm. yeah, this device, oh, sorry, it just has been tested in young, healthy users, so the only market available is not those with memory loss, actually. I would, to piggyback on what Bob said, I was thinking about how we're living much longer and dementia and Alzheimer's is a very big, growing community of who might need this, a device like that, like this, and have you, can you test it on the older people, and are, where are you going with that? You got this. Uh, well, there currently is research being done to look into this in preventing dementia, as we know that slow-wave sleep does decrease during age, and they believe that to be a causative factor in this. So there currently is being research done to ev evidence what you just said, to see if this is a viable treatment for dementia. Has any research been done beyond? Has any research been done beyond the single night to see if there's a cumulative oh. effect if it works a year later? Um, actually, no. So we don't know if it's going to work like um, where you build a tolerance to it, or it could work more like working out, where like you do it every day and it actually gets better every day. So um, that would be one of the things that we'd be researching as we um, during in between our first round and second round of fundraising. And, and related to that. Is there a specification of the particular sounds that you're delivering to the ear and, and any research on why you choose particular ones? Yes, um, so the f some of the first studies to be done actually used pink noise, and they don't really explain their methods for why they use that. That's a noise that kind of sounds like a ch sound, so just, just essentially on that, and it just has a mixture of all frequencies, and they didn't specify why. It's possible that using all those frequencies might prevent the brain from habituating, so being sent, uh, desensitized to it. And then other papers have introduced the idea of using stimulation that changes in frequency, which is actually the, the um, type of stimulation I've been performing. It does um, beeps of changing frequency so that the brain does not become used to it. I have just a couple of comments. Number one, you might be able to avoid the FDA, but you won't avoid the FTC, which is will regulate any claims you make against the product, so you're going to have to have a peer-reviewed study done if you want to make any claims. Right. Mm -hmm. um, the second thing is is that you're going to have to make sure that this is an extremely wearable, comfortable product, and the temperature aspect of it will be really critical because it's you're heating the head with something. But my third comment is, and it ties into what you said about n not knowing the long-term effects. I mm -hmm. personally, I'm not sure I would wear this because of the risk of side effects. You might be improving my recall of words I heard yesterday, but you might be diminishing my ability to, to do mathematics. And so I, you've got to really be careful about the, the making sure you're not creating side effects and that there is long-term value in this mm -hmm. as well. Yeah, the, the neuroscience research that is out there right now indicates that there would be no side effects of the ones you mentioned, just in the sense that different individuals have varying amounts of slow waves. So increasing slow waves in some individuals would really, it wouldn't be improving you beyond a normal healthy margin. And one of the hallmarks of this study is that they found that it did not affect overall sleep architecture. It just improved slow waves during that phase of sleep. So this doesn't interfere with the overall process of sleep. 
And you, you are correct, they've never done testing to see detrimental effects on other functions, but at this time it does not seem likely. Since we have another minute, I, I'm wondering how you think about the market for this. Do you really think it's a medical type market or do you think this is more like a QVC fad effect where you maybe can sell millions of these regardless of whether it works? Well, it's a little, <laughs> you know, well it's, it's a little bit of both. I mean, it definitely has that wow factor that kind of draws you in in the same way a fad does. But the, actually the implications of this uh, go far beyond memory. We didn't include it in the presentation, but um, slow wave sleep is linked to the decrease in amyloid plaques which contribute to, uh, to uh, Alzheimer's. And also is like, uh, linked to heart health, along with um, muscle growth. I mean, there's, there's a lot of different medical factors that we're trying to stay away, mostly because that FDA process. I mean, it's, it's so hard to get past the FDA as a small company. So we're trying to find our, our, our way in. And we think that the healthy student community, as well as those just, maybe their memory, memory is slipping slightly with age, but it's not to full, like full-blown dementia. We feel that people, th those people could truly benefit from this. But I without. will agree that if you could get this cap captured by the, the age of the panel here, and people, people who were facing near Alzheimer's thought that this had value, that's a huge market. Absolutely. And I'm also mm -hmm. thinking that may be the way to do your research. If you right. link it to the phone and collect all the data and let people self-report over time, mm -hmm you may be able to sell this before you know whether it works and then prove it works through the data right. collection. Yeah, exactly. And big data is one of our ways we have some revenue too through our app. Mm -hmm. Are you wearing this every night? Um, I have been, like, right now, it's not what you imagine. It's actually electrodes taped throughout my head. <laughs> but, <laughs> but, so actually that is quite comfortable. So I've been sleeping decently well. Just I, I have to stay up during certain per periods of the night to watch the data. So mm -hmm. there's many, yeah, many aspects to it. That and looking for another Jesse named advisor. Good job. Thank you guys. So I thought it might be helpful to just give you a little sense of what's happened uh, with this big idea program that's, that's led to this point. So as part of innovation at CC throughout this year, um, we've had a number of people come in as Innovation Thursday um, speakers. It's an opportunity for students to get, um, to, to actually get access to an innovator and an entrepreneur in a, in a more intimate setting. And then innovation, or the innovative mind speakers we've had are a little bigger kinds of um, venue events that have been going throughout the year. Um, the team started um, this fall. There was a process of, of registering. We had 17 teams get started in the process. Of the 17 teams, eight completed the full um, process of preparation, and that led to the five um, final teams. There was actually trial, a whole trial um, process where they pitched got feedback, and that also um, helped us get to these seven final teams. Now, there are three additional teams, and two of them really doing incredible stuff, but just not quite ready, and two of them are going to be out in addition to these big idea um, finalist teams in the lobby afterwards, so you have a chance to go by and talk with each of the teams um, a little bit more. But again, it's been a, a great year of learning, a great year of ideas, and translating those ideas into action to make a real difference um, in the world. Okay, next up. Next up is Pickup with CC student members Harvey Kanyaji and Doogie Lagrone. Guys, take it away. Hello, my name is Harvey Kadianji. I'm Doogie Lagrone. And we're here to present about Pickup a cloud platform that aims to help administrators and students to streamline the intramural sports experience. According to a report from the National Intramural and Recreational Sports Association, intramural sports have been said to provide a great way for students to expand their base of friends on campus, while also provide an escape from the pressures of the classroom. However, do you know what is frustrating? The, act the actual process of getting involved in the pickup activity so from the administrator's perspective, this is how it starts. He, cre he or she creates a league and sends out a notification via the school email. Why via the school email? Because there's just no direct way to have a targeted student to say, hey, he's interested in tennis. 
From the student's perspective, the notification may have been received. However, a lack of interest from their social circle limits them from this intramural activity. In my personal experience, I showed interest in intramural basketball. However, none of my friends showed the same interest, and I was left unable to create or join a team. And I think also we can relate from Lugis' experiences that we'll use multiple channels, email, Facebook, whatever can get your hands on, to just get this one experience. And why just not have it under one, like one platform? And this is where Pickup comes in handy. We are offering a one-stop shop that will help students and administrators to have better access of their information around the intramural sports experience. With Pickup, you will receive notifications directed towards your interests. Our, our skill-based algorithm allows for a fun and competitive environment while also creating a user-friendly way to navigate the system. This screenshot here is from our working, from our working project. This will be the sign-up page. Students will be able to select the sports they're interested in and their availability. Also, after they sign up or log in, they'll be sent to, that, um, to their profile page, whereby they'll have all the relevant information that's targeted to them. So if you express you're interested in tennis, you'll only get tennis notifications and or information about tournaments. And also, we have, we'll have ways, um, ladders that will be integrated with the platform so that you can track your position with your friends. Students will also have access to an explore page with an, containing a variety of fitness material, whether it be sport or general. According to the National Intramural and Recreational Sports Association, 70% of students partake in intramural activities during their time in college. With over 3,000 colleges across the country, we are looking at a potential market of 8.4 million users. Currently, we're only focusing on US colleges as a way to give us focus. However, with time, we might ex expand our operations to other countries and or institutions when the time feels right. So we adapted the business to business to customer model as a way to circumnavigate the challenges brought by user acquisition and discoverability. Pickup will be offered in the freemium model. This will see Pickup being implemented in our platform whereby a school will get a separate web page that will house all their data. Why freemium? We chose freemium so that schools can adopt Pickup for the value of it and not have it restricted by other external factors such as budget constraints. However, we plan to make money in two ways, via students and the school. In the Explore section, we are integrating Nike and Fitbit referral programs, along with Google AdMob, where the revenue is 11%, 12%, and 45 cents per click, respectively. We are also looking at offering premium services to the college. Our projected, we aim to make one to two dollars per every user per year. This leads to a projected revenue of 61,000 in the first year, 271,000 in the second year, and for the third year, we should have a better understanding of our use base. And therefore, we hope to expand and both our user base and our revenue to more than half a million dollars. <clears throat> so currently, we're almost launching our final beta version. This comes after eight months of work, testing out many components, asking questions, and figuring out the right technology to implement this. As Harvey said, we're looking for a beta launch in April of 2016 with an alpha launch in June of 2016, and version one in August of 2016. So, I met my co-founder, um, I met Brian in high school, and we bonded over our passion on startups. He is a great designer, and is, has a very successful music venture back in Kenya. He's currently pursuing business and biochemistry at Oklahoma University, and at Pickup, he's responsible with all the design-related activities. This is my second tech startup after CSWAP, which earned me and my then co-founder the ITU World Young Innovators Award. And with CSWAP, I'll be, I'll be responsible with the execution of the vision and also doing all the programming related uh, activities. I've been involved in athletics since a young age and I'm currently playing Division I hockey here at Colorado College, while also majoring in economics with a minor in human biology and kinesiology. My experience in fitness and team related activities will come in helpful as my role as director of content. We are asking for $10,900. Most of the money will go towards client onboarding expenses, such as 
school profiling, and travel and lodging. This is with the intent that we have five schools and 100,000 students on board. The first use of the money will go towards sending a representative to the, um, to the Intramural Sports Institute Conference that will be held in Baltimore from June the 22nd to the 24th, where over 180 Intramural Sports Directors, who most of them make decisions, will I'd say to attend. So what keeps me up at while programming pickup is the prospect it has to disrupt the Intramural Sports marketing. We have created this platform in a way that whenever that new Fitbit comes in, we can integrate it with, with, the, uh, with very little effort. And with that, we believe that we're ahead for success. Thank you. We are Pick Up, Discover, Get Active. So I think questions? Um. I'll start. I, I, think it's, uh, I think you did a great presentation. I mean, this is really professional. This is high level. This is Thank kind you. of what you would expect at, you know, at an MBA level. So great job. Thank you. Um, I can visualize countless other ways to use this uh, algorithm. Um, I'm involved in a deal called the Field House down in Texas, you know, where a million and a half people play sports of one sort or another. It's just total chaos and you know, lacks this kind of order and so forth. I mean, um, I wish you would go through the numbers a little bit more. You talked about the commission structure with Nike and Fitbit. Um, typically, as sales grow, commissions go down. There's some, <laughs> that's the way it works in the world. Um, as this scales, what happens to commissions? Okay, um, so I think um, commissions are one of the ways we'll earn money, but then we're really looking towards ad mob, and that will be measured by um, cost, um, cost per impression and cost per click. So whenever someone sees the ad, or whenever someone clicks on the ad, then with that, scales will really help us. But also we're looking at going forward, like right now we're setting like a premium version as a way to get the audience. And going forward, we are, as he said, we are looking at opening premium version, like a premium version of the app. And I think that's in the future will be like where we'll make most of our money. I hope that answered the question. Yeah. I have a question about other providers. A, a company got, called Active.com has been doing this, uh, starting and running, and then they organized essentially all the municipal and corporate softball leagues, et cetera. What, why haven't they done this? Okay, so we started, um, so right now we are targeting schools. That's like our primary focus. And with schools, we had two, um, pretty much we have two type categories. We have companies doing only intramural sports, and you have companies only doing pickup sports. And that was where we saw the niche, because intramural sports be, are pretty much seasonal. So they'll use the platform after the tournament is done. But then pick up also like pickup activity itself generates great data to fuel inter intramural sports, but then there is no way um, <clears throat> there is like there's no way to pass that data to like the intramural sports. And this is the niche you're trying to fill in. And this is like where we are trying to start first. So I think maybe they didn't do that because they pretty much target that like they are targeting large co corporate corporations which don't have these activities regularly. Um, I, I would just say that I do think you, there's a lot of competition. There's also been a lot of people who've tried this before, both for high school and college, that for some reason the meetup type apps that have tried to sort of circumvent yeah. calendar and Facebook yeah. have had terrible time getting traction. And my one comment is you're, you, you have to launch syncing up with Outlook, Google yeah. Calendar, uh -huh. and Facebook. Mm -hmm. You cannot try to surmount them. You have okay. to be a part of that. And, dumb down your functionality if you need to because you don't need to build a calendar in that. Yeah. You know. yeah, there's a technology related to that that <coughs> we're looking at in higher ed right now called Nudge. Mm -hmm. uh, which, um, and, and I actually think back to this, if your app uh -huh. could actively nudge a person in yes. the social space they're in saying, hey, there's a pickup game right now, yeah. and you say you like basketball, that'll get you the click-throughs and, and the eyeballs that, that'll generate money. Okay. Also, I had a comment on that question, and this is why we are trying to go to the business-to-business -to -business 
business model because these apps are trying the business to customer whereby it's pretty much like if we take if we if we took our app and marketed directly to students um, so we're trying to have it directly to the school so when the schools have a wider adoption then that will create a network effect which can be very a very important asset I just want to remind all the students that intramural sports for us were was a flyer on the wall in Warner Center or a, a, a piece of paper in our mailbox, we used to have mailboxes. So I think it's a great idea. And then I, I'm trying to understand, in one month you are prepared to be, this will be working for five schools next month? No. Or, um, so, so what, what is, is happening? So what we're targeting is that we'll be rolling out, like we'll be going to schools and then hoping that they adopt it for their calendar year. So right now we're targeting an August, um, like an August adoption. So like that's what that's um, that's what that meant. Thank you. So you've developed the code to actually do this. And yes. Now you're refining it and, and yes. it'll work at scale. Yes, and we used um, so like going to technical terms, we use the Node.js hybrid server, mm -hmm. and what that helps us is that we can add, remove, change modules while the server is still running, which is awesome. It <laughs> Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Any other Have you talked to Microsoft yet? I saw in your budget you had Azure costs. It seems to um, me they'd, yes, give, it's they'd a, give it to you, I think. Um, it's 100, 149 per month. I think they'll give it to you if you ask. Oh, okay. <laughs> Thank you for the call. <laughs> <laughs> All right, great job. Pick Thank up. you for your time. <laughs> So this innovation theme at Colorado College wouldn't be possible without a lot of um, support and vision. We're in year four now of not just the Big Idea competition, but this innovation theme at Colorado College, and, and really want to give um, thanks and credit to President Tiefenthaler and the board for having um, this vision, and it's a delight to, to be able to be part of it. Um, we also have a, a board for the Innovation at CC program now that is 17 members, um, mostly faculty from virtually every department and, and division across the, uh, the college. And, and I don't know if you've noticed, but our students also are all kinds of different majors. So the theme of innovation is, is really as relevant to education as it is to music, as it is to English, as it is to economics, computer science, across um, the school. A couple of other um, special thanks. Um, this year we, we kicked off um, our Innovator in Residence program and a special thanks. Michael um, Hannigan has been an Innovator in Residence uh, throughout this entire year and it's been a delight to have him as well as others. And you're gonna hear from Jill about, Jill Lang, about a new Innovator in Residence who just got here and so we've got another uh, month of really interesting um, stuff. Uh, and, and again, we're just about, with all of these pieces coming together, about to roll out a certificate program as well so that our students, with all of this kind of hard work, will be able to lay a certificate of in innovation and entrepreneurship alongside whatever their degree is here at Colorado College. I'd also like to recognize the affiliate programs with us, PIFP, Venture Grants, Idea Space, State of the Rockies, and Ashoka. But finally, you know, anybody involved in innovation at CC would know that the wheels would come off without one particular person, and that's um, Jill Lang. Jill Lang is the one that really makes things happen. And so with that, I'd like to invite Jill Lang up to, to uh, do our first drawings. Jill. Hello, everybody. Uh, I'm having Hamiet Bilji, one of our student employees, help me out. We're going to do our first drawing for our CC students. So if you got a ticket, pull it out. We're going to be drawing for two $50 Amazon.com gift cards. So everybody get your ticket out, get ready. Um, our first winning ticket number is 659576. And our second winner, second winning ticket number, come on down, our second winner, 659573.
Come on down and get your prize. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Okay, so we're going to transition to our next team up. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce Jared Bell and Jackson Kaplan, representing IVEST, Colorado. Thanks a lot, Jill. Thanks a lot for coming out. Thanks for having us. How's it going? My name is Jared Bell. I'm Jackson Kaplan. And our big idea is IVEST Colorado. So IVEST Colorado is going to be an online crowdfunding platform that's going to serve as an intermediary between Colorado-only startup companies and Colorado-only non-accredited investors. Exactly. So we want to provide these local non-accredited investors the opportunity to have equity in local startup businesses that they care about and that they can watch grow. On top of that, we'll be providing these startup businesses to have easy access to capital from local community members. So up until this year, it was only legal for accredited investors to invest in privately owned companies. An accredited investor is someone that has a net worth of a million dollars or around $200,000 of annual income. These represent the wealthiest 5% of Americans. The non-accredited investor is the 95% of Americans that we are targeting for our platform, which just became legal as of this summer. So there are 200, around 200,000 new entrepreneurs entering the Colorado marketplace every single year. Um. Right, and so that's going to be the market that we're going to try to serve with our idea. And so the legislature just went into effect this past year. Uh, I'm sure you guys are familiar with the Jobs Act of 2012, and then under that, Reg A Plus of 2015. So we're going to operate under that Reg A Plus, Tier 1, Rule 144, and the Colorado Crowdfunding Act, which was passed by Hickenlooper in April of 2015. And what that did is give Colorado non-accredited investors exclusive rights to Colorado startup companies. So Colorado startup companies can only get money from Colorado non-accredited investors. So this is what's, what it's going to look like. Uh, you're going to go ahead and log in if you have an account, and if not, you're going to go get started. And then right there, you're going to have either the option to be an investor or be a startup company. So when you go to be an investor, you're going to have two options from there, and that's going to be accredited or non-accredited. And that's going to be by your income, and you're going to give us your personal information, your industry preferences, kind of like the platform you see on Seed Invest. So then for the startup, uh, you're just going to tell us your target amount, and I'll get to that in a second. Uh, let's go back one slide, Jackson. So what you're going to do is tell us how much money you, you want to invest on IVEST Colorado. On your left, you're going to see which companies you've invested in, how much you own in them, your dollar amount, and the percent. On the right, it's going to be like an interest or a tag, so companies that you want to keep an eye on and gauge where they are in their fund fundraising. So then for the startup company, you're going to see a minimum and a maximum amount, and that's so that once you hit your minimum, you're, you've secured those funds, and you're going to get that. And then when you hit your maximum, we're going to take you off the site so that you don't end up over-raising and getting more money than an equity you're willing to give up. And so on the bottom, you're going to see offered equity, and that's, money that, that's the percent that you decide that you're willing to give up your company. Number of investors, which is going to be decided by the market, and then the days left. And that's what's really going to set us apart, is we're going to give our startup companies three months to raise money on iVest, Whereas Seed Invest and Kickstarter are competitors, they're going to give them a hard one-month deadline, and that's so that well, our market's smaller. And then real quickly, I do want to talk about the required forms. So you have to register with Eudora uh, in Colorado, which is kind of like Colorado's version of the SEC. And we're just kind of, and that's going to be the vetting process to kind of prove that every company on our site is legitimate and no one's going to get scammed because we are going to be dealing with non-accredited investors. Um, next slide. Oh, I'm sorry. On top of that. So if you do not raise your minimum amount, what's going to happen is that you're going to get the money kicked back to you if you're an investor, if the startup company you invested in did not hit their minimum amount. And then if it doesn't hit the minimum amount, there's no charge for the company either. So it's just kind of good for them to see the market gauging. Uh, so here's our business model. And uh, we've talked to a number of professionals that have given us quotes. And it's going to be between thirty dollars and $40,000 to get this started. And that's going to be mostly web developing fees for a secure site. And then it's also going to be the incorporation of the legal fees because it is a contract-based business. Um, so then also you're going to have the marketing, and that's going to be huge because I'm going to really push that hard in Colorado so that every venture cap community in Colorado understands that iVest is an option. So you don't have to fundraise through venture cap firms any anymore, but you can go through iVest, which is a crowd crowdfunding platform, which is kind of the up-and-coming fad. And then, I'm sorry. So on top of that, we have our, uh, or under that, we have our profit 
model, and so our profit model is going to be 6% of the success fee, and that's how we make our money. At the end of the three months, we're going to collect 6% of all the money you raise, and that is the lowest of all of our competitors. Um, so recently, just to kind of gauge it, because there's a concept, we can't hand you guys um, a plate of food or a, con or, you know, a platform. So we went to New Tech Pitch Night, which is downtown in the Springs, and what that is is just a platform basically for startup companies to pitch their idea to investors, both, both not accredited and accredited. And we got really good feedback from both sides. Yeah, so there were four startups that pitched the idea. All of them needed seed money. They couldn't find investments. We, they couldn't find people to put money in their pockets. And it was too expensive to go to a venture capitalist firm. That's where we come in. Our platform will provide the service they need. We also pitched at New Tech Startup Night and got great feedback, feedback from both the investor and the startup side. Right, and just like all the ideas here tonight and all of our competition, they're awesome, awesome ideas, but the core of every young and small business is going to be funding, and that's where IVS Colorado comes in. So here are our competition, and it's mostly just Kickstarter and Seed Invests. Kickstarter and Seed Invests are the only companies that offer non-accredited investing for profit, and Kickstarter, what they're going to do is give you a t-shirt or a thank you card when you invest with them, and Seed Invest is only the only company that is going to give you tangible equity, and Seed Invest just started three weeks ago, under, uh, under that Reg A Plus, they started doing non-accredited investing, and they have $25 million pledged from just non-accredited investors in three weeks for startups on their site. But what's going to set us apart from them as well is that we're dealing with non-SEC registered companies. So these are companies that are small. On Seed Invest, you're going to see startups go there for like their Series C funding, and we're kind of targeting a Seed funding or a Series A funding. And then also the community base only in Colorado, and we still offer the lowest rate. Seed Invest is $8,000 to get on the site, and then once you're on the site, it's going to be, I think, an 8.5% fee once you get your uh, total raise. Six to eight percent. So right now, we're just in Colorado. That's where the crowdfunding laws, I know, I know the best. But you can see that there are 28 other states that, have, that currently have crowdfunding laws. And we want to tap into all those markets. And undoubtedly, in the next five years, there's going to be crowdfunding laws in every state because this just happened in, within the last year. And hopefully, you know, the, the dream is that you see IVAS Texas, IVAS Ohio, IVAS Florida, IVAS Illinois. And it, we want it to be a nationwide brand. So this is the team of mentors that we've had kind of guide us through, you know, this entire process. And they all have over 70 years of combined experience with venture cap or public crowdfunding. And uh, so Ken Ashley, he gave us our, our developing fee. And Ken Ashley, Richard Levy, and actually everyone involved <laughs> said that they're willing to invest and would even trade their services for equity in the company. Uh, so thank you guys for having us. If you have any questions, come on. So having invested in a, a lot of companies over the years, right. um, some very small mm -hmm. and some kind of online deals and so forth, uh, never been in one where you have a lot, a whole lot of small investors. Mm -hmm. um, it's hard to run companies, right? And, and maintaining relationships and so forth can be very time consuming, can mm -hmm. kill a company. <clears throat> how does that, how do you visualize that working at the absolute minimum level of investment where you've got a ton of people are calling up to see if they made the pickup yesterday or whatever? Right. So I've taught all the startups that I've talked to uh, to consider them for our site. They've all said that's their biggest reservation. And so what we're going to do is offer a premium and a standard package. So for the premium package, for the startup company, we're going to handle the investors for them, and that's going to be an extra charge. The same thing the Seed Invest offers, and you have to. It's a charge for extra money. But what we're going to do is do all the communication, set up an LLC where all the investors are under one roof. And what we want to do, especially, is it's not a personal interaction. It's not where you can call up and have the contact information of the CEO or founder of the company. You're throwing money just like you would for a Kickstarter campaign, but the, instead of getting a t-shirt, you're going to get a percent in the hand in that company. Does that answer your question? Okay. Do you have a broker liability we, here? We, we don't. We're, we're avoiding the SEC at all costs. Um, and, that, that's, that's, <laughs> and, that's where we need a, and that's where we need a broker. Because we're not taking a transaction fee. We're taking a completed success fee. And so that's what makes us different. We don't need a broker license. No, I actually, I actually dispute that because I'm a registered broker dealer. Okay. And I actually think that 6% commission is a success fee, which would be implicated 
but it may be that there's an exception under the Jobs Act or something. Mm -hmm. but, but most, if you look at Circle Up and the others, they have affiliations with a broker dealer to get around this problem. Th that's right, yeah. But I want I, the, to have the two comments. The first is there's a lot of competition. There's a lot of people doing crowdsourcing right now. Mm -hmm. I like the fact that you're Colorado focused. I will also say that you do have to aspire to that national footprint because Colorado is frankly too small of a market. Correct. Mm -hmm. So you need, I mean, none of us owns 100%, but you need to aspire to own 40 states. So right. per, just like Craigslist, perfect it here, figure, get the bugs out, and then race to get into all the other states. And right. the fact that you are doing it intrastate does get you out of a lot of the screwy laws. Exactly. And mm -hmm. the final thing is, be careful about your special purpose corporations, because you're becoming an investment company, and there are big triggers there that, that will, will get you, will really stumble you. And also, your fees, your fees for communicating, for distributing K-1s and stuff, whatever you think they are, they're 10 times more than that. And you will go broke doing yes. it. Okay. Jonathan, thank you. In fact, I would recommend you not do that until you figure that out, because you will go broke. Okay, okay, certainly. And you don't need it. <laughs> you don't need it. It's good enough. I have a question, just yeah. looking at this and listening to it, it doesn't strike me as investing at all, because in investing requires, in my mind, a, a level of knowledge of the investor that you're not offering and the company can't provide. Mm -hmm. Is this a lottery? I mean, is it more like a lottery? You're just going to throw money at tickets that are this color <laughs> right. and see which one wins? Right. And so we, uh, we, have, we have a definitely a quote from New York Times kind of explaining that this is, it's not necessarily a super liquid investment. And we even have... Uh, a, a huge thing on liquidity, because we have the non-accredited investors to know that the exit strategy is going to be limited. And on top of that, we have a huge risk warning, just like every other crowdfunding site, so that the non-accredited investor understands that it's not, nece it's not necessarily a lottery, because we want the startup company to have you know, their pitch on their profile, so they can kind of make an educated decision, in a sense. But definitely, the exit strategy is something that is going to have to be solved, probably with a buyout from either the startup company or you know, hopefully down the road they grow. Uh, yeah, it's an interesting approach. To, were you thinking then you'd put a required sell back into the initial investment so you could clear out the mess that was referred to here of having 500 investors that right. you can't produce financials for and distribute? Ex exactly, and yeah, and it, it, because it is, it is seed funding. It is Series A funding, where that's what kind of our, that's our market. Guys are just getting off the ground. I mean, you might want to consider that when a company gets to the next round of investor, these investors are required to sell or something because you're going to have to get rid of them yeah. uh, if the company is successful. Yeah, certainly. Um, as an English major, and this was, is not my area of expertise, but I'm really glad you addressed the competition you're going to be facing early on because that's going to be super important. And I also think it was a great presentation. Okay, thank you. Appreciate it. Any other questions? All right, great job, Ivis. So here at CC, we recognize that um, it's really impossible to do this whole, you know, innovation activity without the broader community. And, and uh, you know, one of the things that's been great that's happened over the last couple of years is we've got CC students working out in startups and getting more actively involved in the community, but it's also been with um, the support of some specific organizations and individuals in the community that I wanted to, to recognize. Um, special thanks to Startup, or Peak Startup, for all of the, the support and involvement. Um, really appreciate there's been a great uh, community that's developed between the innovation programs and people at um, the Air Force Academy, at UCCS, at Pikes Peak Community College, and we're really, really thankful for, for the growing uh, community of, of innovation that exists between um, the schools. Um, and appreciate um, some of just the places, um, Lisa Tassarowitz and, and uh, the Epicentral, you know, regularly now has students there, either at startup events or working in companies. And I just wanted to acknowledge the broader community. And we've had so many mentors and advisors from the community, alums, and people who aren't alums that have leaned in just for a passion to, to help advance this really exciting stuff that you see here um, today. So thank you so much for that. And a special thanks 
um, today also for our sponsors and prize contributors this afternoon. So at the end, you're gonna, there's the $500 Mountain Chalet, so shout out and thanks to, to Mountain Chalet. Wild Goose has chipped in. Um, outdoor Ed, big theme at, at here at Colorado College. So thanks to all of you. And with that, I'm gonna ask Jill to come up and do the, the next round of drawings. <clears throat> Okay, get out your tickets, get ready. Uh, we're going to be giving away, courtesy of Outdoor Ed Program, a $150 credit towards one of their activities. So, <coughs> tickets ready. Winning number is 659-602. Anybody in the house? <laughs> Up top, come on down, all right. <laughs> I feel like we should be doing like the price is right and have music for you, but you know. <laughs> All right, congratulations. Our next prize, as Patrick mentioned, the Wild Goose Meeting House has graciously leaned in with a $25 gift card and a free mug. So we'll read out the next number for that prize. Six five nine six one five. All right, come on down. Okay, great. Thank you. Our final team is about ready to take the stage. We'll be introducing Neonic with our presenters Cormac Siegfried and Nick Ravitch. Neonic. <laughs> All right. Thanks, guys. Thank you, Jill. We're really happy to be here. The big idea means so much to us. Like she said, I'm Cormac Siegfried. Um, I handle high-level relationships, and I do branding legwork. I'm Nick Ravitch, I mostly handle marketing legwork and writing copy, uh, but when I wasn't looking, Cormac changed my official title on this pitch to Synergy Monk. So you're gonna see that <laughs> later on. Thanks, Cormac. Uh, so we're gonna talk to you a little bit about our company called Neonic, uh, and that begins with a conversation about why people go to concerts. It's not just for the music. You can save a lot of time and money and get actually better sound quality if you just stayed home. <laughs> people go for the experience. Most people don't wanna do this home alone in their living room. <laughs> exactly, take Woodstock. On paper, it was the worst music festival in history. There were over 5,000 emergencies. It was rainy, it was muddy. Some guy got run over by a tractor. Yeah, it was ridiculous. Um, so why was it so iconic? When people talk about Woodstock, they talk about individual moments. Moments that together built a powerful experience. Moments like when Melanie Safka took the stage in the middle of the night during a torrential downpour. It was so dark and rainy, she couldn't even see past the first few rows. She barely even had enough courage to get up to sing in the first place. But then something amazing happened. One person held up their lighter, then another, and pretty soon the entire crowd was glowing and a tradition was born. It was moments like that that made Woodstock so special. Uh, and since then, the expectation for concert experience has only grown into this. This is crazy. This doesn't help you listen to music. It's just total stimulus overload, but it's absolutely what people expect now. Absolutely. And in line with this brand new concert experience, people are waving their smartphones instead of lighters. Um, only thing is... It's just blank. This is all it is. <laughs> So what Neonic is doing is turning this crowd into a light show by wirelessly connecting the audience's phones through our app so that the performer or their light guy can turn the crowd into a canvas of light and they can use it to create waves, they can use it to create ripples, they can use it to create psychedelic patterns of colors go across the entire crowd. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we're creating uh, these crazy light shows today and bringing them to the audience with just mm -hmm. one application. An application that's being reviewed by Android and Apple right now. And we're really excited about that because it was really hard. Uh, but it works, and we're <laughs> super patenting it, so. Yeah, exactly. Um, and despite the complexity of our back end, our front end is super simple. It was recently proven that the attention span of a millennial is now no joke shorter than that of a goldfish, which is <laughs> great. Um, yeah. It's also why we're including our app as a download with ticket sales, so that even the most goldfishy millennial will have our app at, at their concerts. <laughs> All you have to do is swipe right on a notification to join the light show. Very, very simple. Yeah. And uh, we're starting right here at CC making an appearance at this week, Friday's Play Hard event, but our big launch is gonna be at the annual Lama Palooza Music Festival. Really excited about that. So stepping beyond campus, we've already pitched to Dot Lishik over at Broadmoor World Arena. 
Uh, she's really excited about Neonic, and she's invited us to do testing at her 8,000 seat stadium, which is gonna help us out a lot. Mm -hmm. But really, how are we gonna make money with this thing? So on this one, we actually have a lot of options. Right now, though, we're just laser focused on getting our experience out there and showing people how cool a crowd turn light show actually is. Exactly, but in the future, we can do things like charge for the ability to control the app, we can collect crowd data, we can send merchandise sales buttons directly to consumers at concerts, and deliver their purchases to them at the concerts. We can even make crowd size ads. We can do a lot, but right now, creating the experience that we want is everything. Which is why our brand is so important. The Neonic brand is about taking what people loved at Woodstock and putting it into every concert in the 21st century. We want people to expect Neonic at concerts because it resonates with this sense of uh, community and culture and youth. Um, and we've even created our own mascot, Raleigh the Lion. He's right back there. there Stand up, is. Raleigh, for a second. <laughs> Hype up the crowd a little bit, Raleigh. Get, yeah, there we go, Raleigh. <laughs> nice job, Raleigh. Uh, and he's gonna help us tell our story a little bit. Yep, exactly. And we've also done things like create playlists on Spotify so we can engage with our users when they're at home. Also, doing a super cool thing where we're making a brand new ranking system for DJs based on how hard their audience is dancing at concerts. How much fun are they having? So we have a bit of momentum already. Um, we have raised over $10,000 in family and friends funding. We've uh, made five formal pitches. We've placed at two competitions. We've made a bunch of partners out in LA in the DJ scene, and we have an advisory board that's just about as excited at Neonic as we are. And one of the most important members of that advisory board has been Ben Sparks. He joined um, in September working pro bono with us. He set up our C Corp, our stock cap. Uh, cap. He's been really, really helpful. Mm -hmm. Uh, so our team, I love. Uh, we have really good communication <laughs> skills, um, and we've managed uh, to overcome obstacles and surprises a lot. Um, a surprise like when I walked into the Innovation House uh, two days after we got the first version of our technology to find a smartphone plugged into every single outlet. Cormac had gotten really excited and went and drove to every Best Buy in Southern Colorado and bought every Moto E around here. You cannot buy them around here anymore. We have all of them. Um, <laughs> and within 36 hours, we created a testing event and a video for it, um, and it just took two and a half gallons of coffee, yeah, two and a half gallons of coffee and uh, a lot of hard work. Just about. But caffeine and elbow grease won't buy us promotional videos or space for developers to work in. It won't get us Facebook boosts, event security, Amazon web servers, developers licenses, or even our patent. We, in the beginning, we will be hosting our own events, like we already have. We need to be able to pay for the plane ticket to the pitch of our lifetime in LA. We need $30,000 to turn our inspiration into something real, something beautiful, something called Neonic. Thank you. So I think your presentation is very timely because the music industry has been changing a great deal. And a lot of the revenue uh, for music is coming from the live shows and less in the, in the LA recording studios. Mm -hmm. So great timing, and are you going to work with, you can partner with these studios as well, and I mean, you can take this yep. to Beyond Live Nation. Oh, yeah, yeah, Beyond how, Live Nation. How do you so, see that? Right, so we, Live Nation is actually the biggest concert producer in, in, in the world right now, um, and so they're our ideal partner. And the, what we figured out through our research is that these promoter and production companies like Live Nation and AEG Live, um, they're the big players. There's also Insomniac Events that makes EDM festivals, and EDM is our target market for entry. Um, and it's, it's these promoters that will bring us to the artist, that will bring us to the end user. And then, uh, did you mention the competition? Yes. Uh, there are other people who make crowdsourced light shows. Um, they, Wham City Lights is one that uses audio signals from the, from the actual band to make it happen, uh, which means it's pre-recorded and you have to make a brand new app for every single event, including a new pre-recorded song. The second is PixMob. Yeah. Um, PixMob uses actual hardware, so it's like a bracelet, and people have probably seen that around somewhere. They do it at Taylor Swift concerts sometimes, and they did it at the Sochi Olympics even. Um, but the difficulty with that is that you're paying for each one of those wristbands every time you want to do a show. Also, the way that they change them is they blast the audience with infrared cannons uh, <laughs> to try to change it. So if there's not a direct line of contact, or if something happens with one of those cannons, it all goes away. It's also a huge overhead. And one of the really cool things that we have that's different from them is our emergency response, which Nick can tell you about because he's an actual EMT. So I got trained uh, as an EMT out in UCLA, um, and one of our final tests was an electronic dance music concert because it's the worst case scenario. Um, they're not gonna stop the concert if someone gets hurt. Uh, so uh, what happens with this potential app, this potential usage for it, is um, since Neonic's able to locate where people are, which Cormac can explain later with technology out of slide, mm -hmm. um, you avoid situations like this. So 
Right now, the biggest way that uh, these med tents at festivals get patients, they're EMTs that patrol, but far and away, the biggest way they get patients is walk-ins. Um, patients' friends will drag them to it, or if they don't have friends around, they get lost. Bystanders, um, the issue is when neither of those things happen, when you get tragedies. Uh, so there was a woman last year who was on the second floor of a concert, and someone called 911 because she was having a heart attack, um, and it took about 15 minutes for EMTs to get there that were actually at the stadium already. They were um, hired by the stadium. They just couldn't find her. Um, and it got to the point where EMTs um, got, found her and got help finding her because people were shining their phones onto her to try to signal um, to them where they are. Yeah. And our app would be able to point the EMTs directly where the emergency is. So it sounds like you're betting the farm on the Los Angeles event. Bet, uh, making, uh, betting that that will be the thing yeah. that will bring us to the Is that true? Or? Um, we just have a very good opportunity in LA. No, no. Yeah, uh, which, but it's not our only strategy to market. Um, we also want to do things like use our established DJ network, which is as of now pretty extensive to start getting them to use our, our app and Neonic, but Live Nation would certainly be an acceleration. But if you... If you don't land at Live Nation, how, how much money is left out of your budget for travel and all that? Now, is, is the enterprise still sustainable? After our pitch at Live Nation? Yep. Um, we, what we have for the summer expenses, oops, wrong way, um, that will get us through the summer, but we're also already engaged with some investors, both in LA, in San Francisco, and we would be planning on raising about $300,000 to pay for our scale. Okay. Um, if Live Nation doesn't work out. Who does so the programming of the content? To good advantage, in other words. Yes, exactly. Um, the programming of the content happens, uh, we have three developers in Fort Collins who have been working um, a lot on making this happen. And they've gone through several iterations. The newest one uses um, the beacons and we're able to get radials through the crowd. Um, <coughs> and our summer development is to get, is to um, use Bluetooth RSSI solely to create a triangulation uh, using graph theory and some other cool math that we're really excited about. Um, that Sam is really good at graph theory. I've got a friend who's studying mathematics at Harvard, Aaron Slipper, uh, and we also just got a CC student to help us out with math as well. Um, so who is the actual buyer that pays you money for this? So in the beginning, we're really focused on getting the light show out. So in the beginning, we're just gonna be iterating events, events, events. But in the future, uh, the one of the biggest um, sources of revenue for promoters is the merchandise sales. So if we do something like a live merchandise sales buttons to the consumers, either at sports stadiums or at concerts, then we would take a commission fee from the promoter for giving them that service. Or if we are pushing advertisements through sponsorship, we would take a commission fee in promote, in, um, as a team with the promoters. So the promoters are gonna be making revenue off us. Well, I'll tell you, for, for a guy who really dislikes crowd and crowds and noise, mm -hmm. I, I this is a really good idea. Oh, so wow. Well done. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. Really appreciate that. I wasn't sure. You definitely want to expand to sporting events. Yes. Uh, there's so much downtime at baseball and other things. Oh, yeah. And, and 100%. <laughs> also, what, what you know is that everybody has a cell phone, and they don't need dance music stuff, but they need Giants. San Francisco Giants fan. Yeah. You know, <laughs> light the stadium up with the Giants logo. Yeah, absolutely. No, we definitely want to do that. Uh, we really want to go to stadiums because the other thing about stadiums that's really cool is they're circular. So you can actually see the image on either side. Um, and s sports is also a way bigger market than, um, than concerts worldwide. The English Premier League gets 4.3 billion views per year. That's insane. Um, so so is Live, Na uh, Live Nation is owned by the guy who owns the Rams. The Rams. Is that correct? I, I'm not sure I couldn't it's say. It's Bill Anschutz. Yeah. Well, that's AEG, I'm sorry. Okay. Phil Anschutz is, owns AEG, which is the second yeah, largest. Stan, uh, Stan yeah. a, the Walmart guy, and yeah, Screaming Cronky. Eagle, and all that yeah. stuff. So, yeah. you know, he's you know, obviously plugged into the football business, right? That I would mean, be, yeah. he, he was able to move a team without any problem at all. But mm -hmm. you know, I, I certainly agree with Scott. That, you know, all these things where people used to put up. Uh, those billboards, you know, they had to make things, an image. That, that's For all sure. gone away. Yeah, no, we can just do yeah. the, the okay. phone. Without any hardware in the stadium, which is, yeah. that's the cool part. Yeah. Yep. Cool. Um, you guys have any more questions? This is how big the EDM market is, our entry slide, our entry market, which is massive. That's worldwide, 147 million tickets bought annually that we'd like to reach. 
Um, yeah, we're really excited. The other guys gave us fish. Are you going to give us ecstasy? <laughs> <laughs> You know? Thank you. <laughs> we thought that might be an unfair advantage. But. Yeah. <laughs> All right, let's All give right. it up for Live Nation. Or be be on it. Yeah. Live Nation. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Okay, so Jill will take over, and the okay. judges you, will Mark. follow me yep. to deliberate and decide. All right, how about we do a round of applause for all five of our teams. They all did a great job. So while the judges are in their ante room deciding who our winners are for tonight, we've got some more fun in store for all of you while you're hanging out to find out the results. Uh, we are going to do a cheering competition for our five teams. The team that has the loudest cheering section here tonight, that team will win dinner on the town courtesy of Innovation at CC at a future date. So everybody's been really loud tonight. We appreciate that, but I'm going to call it each team by name. And Hamiet and I will arbitrarily decide who we think the winning team's cheering section is. So those of you here to cheer for King of the Sea, let me hear you. And for Spindle. Pick up. Ives, Colorado. Okay, uh, and last but not least, Neonic. <laughs> now we're a little bit deaf, but that's okay. We think we're gonna go to Neonic is our winning team. But reassure the cheering section, sorry, you're not a part of the dinner, but Cormac and Nick and all their team, thanks to you, and maybe your mascot. Thanks to you guys for cheering on your teams tonight. We appreciate it. On to the grand prize tonight. For everybody has got their ticket, get it handy. We want to thank again Jim and Elaine Smith of Mountain Chalet. Tremendous generosity in giving a $500 gift card out tonight for one lucky student. So let's get right to it. The winning number is 659-616. Come on down. <laughs> All right, before we transition to uh, the night's nice entertainment while the judges are deliberating, I want to do a quick shout out to somebody in the audience. We have for recognition tonight, Carolyn Chen is in our audience. She is an uh, innovator in residence for this month at CC. Uh, Innovation at CC is really pleased to have her here, have her share her time and her talent as a music innovator. Uh, Carolyn's had her music um, featured at exhibits in 19 different countries, and her focus in innovation is helping to retune our ears with music, sound, light, image, and movement. So thank you, Carolyn. We're happy to have you here for this month of April. <laughs> now we're going to uh, segue uh, for all of your benefit while we're waiting on the judges to return. Um, we are offering a showcase for you tonight of the KRCC program called A Day in the Life. Uh, we're going to have on stage with us here tonight the Assistant Professor of Music, Ryan Benigali, and Steve Hayward, Associate Professor of English, who, <laughs> who are part of the collective geniuses also behind the KRCC program, Critical Karaoke, which you may have heard of. Um, the Day in the Life, uh, the program is arranged around brief uh, two-minute segments about music history broadly construed, so the whole gamut of anything with music and music history and the day in the life. It's featured on KRCC on weekdays at 6.30 in the morning, um, at noon, and again at 9 p.m. So we'll give you a little bit of taste of it tonight, but know that you can find them regularly on KRCC as well. So my, and iTunes. Uh, so my thanks to Ryan and to Steve for sharing their time with us tonight, and I will hand it over to you. All right. Hello, hello. Hello, hello, Colorado College. Let's see the cell phone faces. Yeah, that's, yeah. <laughs> hey, how's everybody doing? Okay, yeah. So we're, uh, I, love, I love the energy in the room. 
it's really it's really great to uh, feel. So we're uh, it's like we're, a normal class day. We're here to talk. We're here to talk to you. We uh, here to talk a little bit about these modules that we do day in the life. A bit of the background on how we got going on them. We were uh, putting together a radio show called Critical Karaoke, and uh, we needed some way. We we're we we're going to air with that about once a month, and we needed some way to make contact with an audience. Uh, more frequently than that. It's very hard to build audience um, when you only are on the air once a month. And uh, I don't know, we were like hanging around and I said something like, you know what we should do? We should do a thing called A Day in the Life, uh, which will be music, cultural, and whatever kind of history. And, uh, and then we just did one. And um, like a lot of, uh, an artistic, uh, I guess, startup is different from other startups in that uh, you really hate, you really don't know what the thing is until you've made it. And so we started making them. And right away, we really liked that process of, of doing these sorts of musical equivalents of Pulse of the Planet or Writer's Almanac, but where music is the vehicle, is the doorway for entering into all kinds of other topics. And hopefully they're not as, you know, not to not put down Garrison Keillor, but maybe we're a little more lively than Garrison Keillor? I don't know, we'll see. Yeah, sure. <laughs> <laughs> so we're going to play, play a couple of them for you. We're going to start off with one of the earliest ones we did. Um, the voice that you're going to hear in this episode of Critical of, of Day in the Life is Professor Idris Goodwin. Yeah. I'm Idris Goodwin, and this is a day in the life for March 16th. It was on this day in 1959 that William Jonathan Drayton Jr., also known as Flavor Flav, Woo! was born in Roosevelt, Long Island, New York. They call me Flavor, flavoristic, majestic Flavor. Though as a youth he showed musical promise with a variety of instruments, he'd emerge onto the world stage as a member of the groundbreaking political hip-hop group Public Enemy. Fight the power! Fight the power! And like his name might suggest, Flavor Flav was a colorful contrast to the militant persona of public enemy frontman Chuck D. Flavor was electric, animated, high-pitched, and comical, along with his signature yeah, boy. <laughs> expressions and irreverent rhymes. Flavor Flav's look also spoke with exclamation points. He wore baggy tracksuits and top hats and shades, and opposed to the iconic dookie gold rope chains worn by their contemporaries like Run DMC and Big Daddy Kane or the African medallions of De La Soul, Flavor Flav's neck was adorned with a large clock. Initially, the members of Public Enemy and Rick Rubin of their home label Def Jam didn't exactly understand what Chuck D saw in Flavor Flav. To them, Public Enemy was a serious group with a hard edge sound. But Chuck D knew that it would take both the brothers studying in the library and the brothers cracking jokes on the corner to really fight the power. And the rest, as they say, is history. Don't believe the hype. All right. A Day in the Life is a production of... So that gives you some idea of what we're doing. We're actually uh, the team. I always, I always, my always, my favorite part of all these pitches is when people talk about the team. The team, which we love, uh, <laughs> is uh, you know we're laser focused on uh, producing. We actually, uh, we uh, we actually got our first seed money, as it were, uh, <laughs> last year. It was a whopping uh, five thousand uh, bucks from uh, from the which which really was what we need, and we in fact have produced a year of Day in the Life. We've just celebrated our year anniversary, which is... Uh, Thank you. Initially, we were, we were very... We, we, I, I would say things like, if we can make it out of this month, uh, you know, we'll be, we'll be so fantastic. And then we kind of got into eight months and then nine months. And I was saying things like, when we get into the new year, when we have a year, and then we entered into the calculations of how that would affect the programming and what days we could use from the previous year. I initially did the calculating, and uh, he's an English professor. Remember? Yeah, I'm a professor of English, and Ryan Benegali told me you have it completely wrong. This is the way that it moves. That was a, hu a horrible surprise, but uh, but also exciting. And one of the interesting things about it has been to go back and listen to ones like our Flavor Flav. Uh, which was one of the first ones that we did that got a really wide response. There were lots of downloads, a lot of comments, a lot of real positive feedback, and that was, I think, the moment when we knew we had something like proof of concept. But let's play another one. Uh, go ahead, Ryan. Yeah, so one of the things we do is every single day is keyed to an event for that particular day, right? The birthday of Flavor Flav. Sometimes it's a historical event, a musical event, or some other seemingly unrelated musical event. Um, or an event that's not even musical to begin with be becomes musical through the genius mind of Stephen Hayward. 
I'm Steve Hayward and this is a day in the life for January 4th. It was on this day in 1984 that Wayne, the great one, Gretzky, scored eight points in a single game for the second time in his career. Gretzky's eight made up more than two-thirds of the scoring in the Edmonton Oilers' 12-8 defeat of the now-defunct, or at least moved to Dallas, Minnesota North Stars. Though perhaps the most unmelodious of all professional sports, anyone who has ever been to a hockey game knows that it's music that scripts most of what fans do. Whether it's the call of the organ, or clapping along to Queen. Whether it's the strains of Celine Dion escorting an errant player to the penalty box. Oh, or of John Sebastian welcoming him back. Welcome back. The good old hockey game is a game with a soundtrack. North of the border, that's a playlist that includes Stompin' Tom Connors' hockey song. It's hockey night tonight. And of course, the hockey theme an instrumental track written by Dolores Kleiman, which is almost never heard outside of Canada. A classically trained composer, Kleiman had never seen a hockey game in her life and would say later that she had composed it while imagining Roman gladiators wearing skates. For 40 years, the hockey theme would run during the credits of Hockey Night in Canada, a kind of unofficial national anthem. But when the Canadian Broadcasting Company couldn't reach an agreement about extending their license to the song, it was dropped. And the rest, as they say, is history. One, there's a, one of the interesting things about when you do these, we do one every single day, and in fact, right now, uh, we morphed, we also have been picked up by classical music stations, and so we do one that is sort of geared towards a more popular market, or a sort of more general music market, and then we do another one every day that's geared towards uh, a sort of a classical uh, market or, or rather the way that we I, I think sometimes think about it is what can we what can we get on to the classical stations what will they not cancel us if we give them to play <laughs> and uh, you know we sometimes pushed it <laughs> on occasion uh, but you know so we're, we're one thing when you do a lot of it you you sort of when you do this every day you become aware of your preoccupations and sometimes you have things that you really want to write about and not always does uh, the historical datum match up with those desires? So quite often, like with that hockey night in Canada one, uh, you know that I knew that I wanted to write about hockey. And if ever possible, I will write about, if there's any Canadian angle whatsoever, <laughs> I, will, I will seize it like, <laughs> uh, you know, as, like a predator. I'm razor focused on that kind of cultural imperialism where soon Canada will take over uh, in the United States. It's a long shot that it could happen. And, uh, it, it, it could happen. Yeah, it's so <laughs> on occasion, you find ourselves uh, you know, sort of uh, moving over. Um, but we wanted to give you a little bit of, of uh, insight into what goes in, you know, not quite a bloopers reel, but you know, we do this a lot, and we do it from different locations. We do it from different... Um, the first uh, a sort of unfortunate mistake uh, that uh, we're going to play for you is one that we did. Uh, it's one that Ryan did about uh, a musical called uh, Crazy for You. Right. This is a Gershwin musical, um, revival of a musical uh, from yonder year. That we, we, we record our audio and then we, we send it up to our producer, uh, Craig Richardson in Denver. He mixes it down with all the different audio examples. So this one should have been filled with you know, hits from Tin Pan Alley, um, good old Gershwin standards. Yeah, and he, so he sends it, what happens is we record it, we write it, we record it, we send it to him in Denver, he mixes it down, he sends it back to us, and then our team, which I love, uh, <laughs> which includes two Harvard-trained musicologists, uh, we listen to it. That is true. And if we, if we, I'm not one of them. Uh, you know, we have in our team, we have two Harvard trained musicologists, a producer, and then two like totally not trained musicologists. And uh, on occasion, you know, we will catch errors that the others have made or that uh, was made by our producer. And uh, so what, what Ryan is going to play right now is one where our producer, to make sure that we were paying attention included some factual inaccuracies <laughs> in the audio that goes along with it. And what you need to know is that uh, the song that begins this is not from the Gershwin musical, Crazy For You. It just has the same title. So here it is. Here it is. 
I'm Ryan Benegali, and this is A Day in the Life for February 19th. It's a Madonna song. Today in 1992, <laughs> Crazy for You, the Tony Award winner for Best Musical that year, opened on Broadway. It was a surprise hit, given what else was playing on the so-called Great White Way. It was surrounded by a host of imports from London's West End, including Phantom of the Opera. Having my baby. <laughs> what a lovely way of saying how much you love me. Cats. <laughs> Miss Saigon. Adios, Espacito. <laughs> Adios, Sarge. Say a prayer for Surf Boy. Wherever he is. Semper Fi, soldier. Semper Fi. Sick transit Gloria. Maybe we'll meet again someday. And Les Miserables. You're what the French call les incompetents. What? Chief theater critic of the New York Times, Frank Rich, prophesied that Crazy For You might be the exact moment at which Broadway finally rose up to grab the musical back from the British. So what happened is we, uh, we got that, and I actually think that I heard the audio, the mix down of it first. And, you know, I, my reaction was something like, wow, I didn't know that that Madonna song came from Gershwin. Did Gershwin write that song? I, you know, I wrote back a very positive, like, wow, there's a lot of music in there. You're, you're that very I gracious. You know, yeah. I, didn't, I didn't connect that with it at all. And then our Harvard-trained musicologist stepped in and said, no, Steve, you know nothing. <laughs> and it's, it's always nice. Uh, as I was saying, we all have our obsessions. We do. We all, we all have our, our, areas, our st areas of strength, our areas of weakness. And sometimes, though, you get a little too close. You get a little too personal. And we also have that. We also, you know, one of us will write something. It'll get produced. And it'll come back to the group. And <laughs> sometimes, this doesn't happen all the time, but it has happened. And the, the team, which I, I love them, uh, <laughs> the team says... It's, it's too personal. And this is one that didn't make it to air, and even though it maybe ruffled some feathers that it didn't get into, you know, because you have to make this call, it's still, I think it was the it's right what's decision. What's best for the team? You, you decide if this is a general audience thing. I'm Ryan Benegali, and this is A Day in the Life for February 11th. Today in 2010, Felix Benegali, my son, was born in Cambridge, Massachusetts. <laughs> to see. He arrived unexpectedly, not allowing me the chance to put on appropriate mood music as our car navigated the snowy streets of Boston in the dead of night. Instead, we had the shins. You got too much to wear on your sleeve. It has too much to do with me. But from such musical origins, an unqualified musical genius was born. This is his opus number one, created when I left GarageBand open on my laptop on the 1st of May, 2014. Is it on par with Bach, Mozart, and Beethoven? Who's to say? Well, I am, and it is. And the rest, as they say, is history. Yeah. Did not make it to air. I think it was the right call. Ryan was a little bit, which, you I, know. I got over it. It was okay, Steve. Yeah, the I, thing about know. the team. I'm going to write one about your son next. So. The thing, yeah, exactly. <laughs> the thing about the team is that they're not always on the same team. You know, because it's a team of academics. You're always like, what is going on? You know, it's like, uh, the, the thing, uh, you know, one of the things to keep in mind when you're, whether you're doing a startup, whether you're doing something, um, any piece of art, any kind of venture, uh, is that it starts uh, really in nothing. And uh, there's a famous uh, documentary about Daniel Lenoir, and th in the near the beginning of it, uh, Lenoir and Brian Eno, the great producer, have a conversation. And one of the things Eno says in it is he says, whatever you say in this documentary, get this across, that music begins from nothing. It comes from nothing whatsoever. All art begins as complete crap. And um, one of the things about our day in the life modules is that we produce them uh, we record them, at least initially, in a variety of contexts, uh, in much the same way 
as uh, you know, whenever I write any of my novels or whatever kinds of scripts that I'm working on, I do it uh, sort of in my house with my family, who I love, uh, around great me. Great team. It's a great team. And uh, they've come to they've come to in the same kind of way that when I'm working on a on a piece of fiction, a piece of writing, an essay, recommendation letter for a Colorado college student. I need complete silence. I need to not be disturbed. And that goes over with lukewarm. And sometimes it goes over, sometimes it doesn't. Uh, and what we thought we'd give you, just to give you a sense, to make that point that Brian Eno makes about the way in which all art begins in this kind of everyday way, we thought we'd give you one of the outtakes um, from the, uh, that one of, this is what the raw, as they say in the industry, this is what the raw audio sounds like. This is what we give to Craig uh, this is what Steve gives to Craig. This is what I give to Craig. <laughs> and one of the things that I'm very conscious of, and I think this comes across in the, uh, in the piece, uh, in, this, in, this, in this raw audio, one of the things that comes across is that Craig is a radio professional, and I am not a radio <laughs> professional. And that is something that Craig reminds me of a lot. And sometimes it comes across in the, in the recording when I sometimes refer to him as a kind of malignant, very critical consciousness uh, who is thinking bad things about... Anyway, let's just play it. I'm not proud of this. This is why it takes lots of edits for Steve. You know, he likes to talk, so it's, <laughs> it's, a, it's a process for all of us. Here we go. Okay, here we go. Day in the life for February 26, Craig. That was in the beginning. That was just me <clears throat> saying it. <clears throat> okay, here we go. I'm Stephen Hayward, and this is a day in the life for February uh, 26th. All right, listen, I'm taping here. Francis, can you keep it down? Franny? Eddie, keep it down, okay? No using the microwave. All right, here we go. I'm Stephen Hayward, and this is... Oh, sorry. Oh, Craig, sorry. Let me try it again. Okay, here we go. On what? I'm Stephen... I'm Stephen Hayward. <laughs> I'm Stephen Hayward, and this is a day in the life for February 20... Oh. Sorry, Craig. Uh, I'm Stephen Hayward, and this is the day in... This is a day in the life for February 26... Sorry, Craig. All right. I'm Ryan Benigali. <laughs> Benigali. 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 I'm Ryan Menegali. I'm Ryan Menegali. <laughs> I'm Stephen Hayward, and this is a day in the life of February 26th. I'm, you know, it's my birthday today, Craig. I'm not saying that. I'm Stephen Hayward, and this is a day in the life for February 26th. The day on which I got nothing for my birthday from Ryan Benegali. <laughs> I'm Stephen Hayward, and this is actually my birthday. No kidding, Craig. Sorry, all right? I'm sorry, <laughs> Craig. I'm, oh, jeez. So this is some of the things that our, our producer has to deal with, uh, with uh, the audio of Mr. Stephen Hayward. Out of that, he spins gold. <laughs> are, are the judges done? I think we're still, I think we're still stalling here. Um, are, we, are we back? Are you done? Are you guys ready? Okay, then we will. All right. Should we call it there? Yeah. Okay. All right, judges. So let's just one more time. I heard the cheering. So how about all the cheering teams at once for the results of the Big Idea Competition? Let's hear it. And all of the teams, you're invited to, the judges would love to give you kind of direct feedback and connect with you um, personally. So, so everybody, please come up and, and chat with the judges. But in third place is Spindle. <laughs> and $5,000 to help you guys advance with your research and development efforts. Judges. Yep, you got it. <laughs> Take that to the bank. <laughs> See how that works for you. Um, and we actually have co-first place winners. So sharing first place is K. 
King of the Sea, and the Onyx. Twenty-five thousand for King of the Sea to buy fish. Twenty thousand for Neonic. Yeah. Let's have you together. Thank you all so much for coming. The teams will be outside. Make sure you stop by and let them know what you think. <laughs>